Hi, I'm David Freck, lead pastor of Church of the Harvest, and thanks for joining us for our rebroadcast of the sermon that we preached this past week. No matter what part of the week you're in, whether it's the morning, midweek, or in the evening, we're just glad you're wanting to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And we believe the Word of God helps you do that. We're committed to it. We believe it'll change your life. We believe you'll be inspired, you'll be encouraged, you'll be challenged, and we want you to respond. So would you do that when you listen to this message? If you feel God speaking something into your heart or if there's something we can pray with you about, there's many ways you can do that. You can see that in the description below. We encourage you to do that. God bless you. Thanks for joining us and have an amazing experience as you listen to the Word of God. All right, so let's get into the Word for a few minutes. Kingdom Come, we've been talking about this for quite some time now. It's this idea of building our foundations in worship. That's all the idea behind it is. Last week we talked about uh, building the foundation of thanksgiving, understanding what thanksgiving is as a gate, as a portal into what God is in his presence. So you can't approach God without thanksgiving. And that thanksgiving was actually designed within the Levitical sacrificial systems. It was designed so that there could be an expression of gratitude, not just an expression of obligation or responsibility or an acknowledgement of sin or failure, but this acknowledgement of the goodness and the mercy and the favor of God. And so that's where thanksgiving kind of flows from. But I want to take you to uh, where we started last week, which is Psalm 100. Psalm 100, I'm just going to read two verses for you. It says, enter his gates with... All right, let's try that one more time. Enter his gates with... Have you ever wondered why we, we're maybe a little bit different church, depending on where you've come from, what your church culture has been, uh, but we always begin our engagement with God in our church, we always begin with worship, with praise and thanksgiving. You'll notice it's always up-tempo, it's celebratory, because this is God's design. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Now, we'll be more devotional, more kind of classic worshipful in our style at the end of the service. But as we enter, we want to enter gratefully. We want to enter praisefully. We want to enter because when we do that, we minimize where we've been, what we went through this week, the struggles we've had, uh, the adversities we faced, and we magnify the significance of who God is. That's what thanksgiving, that's what praise does for your soul. And if you, if you struggle with the greatness of God, the glory of God, the wonder of God, I'm going to suggest you need to put on your praise hat. Amen. I'll say it again. Put on your praise hat. And begin to exercise expressions of praise because it makes you think about who God is and not where you've been or what you faced or the hardships you're in. Now, I'm not saying those things don't exist. And those things can be confronted through prayer and supplication. But as I enter, come on, if I, if I, if I want to have an attentive ear, I want to start with praise. If my first engagement with the President of the United States would be, you know, you're an idiot and this is so bad and how could you let this happen to me? He might not be quite as resonant to listen. But I'll come and say, man, you're doing an amazing job. I really appreciate all you do, blah, 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 blah. And by the way, could you help me with? Anybody getting the point? It, will say, it, it tends to work a little easier. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. Say it again. The Lord is his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. So last week we talked about entering the door of thanksgiving. Today we're going to talk about the path of praise. Today we're going to talk about the path of praise. And I think it's important that we look at praise as a path because praise is a journey. You're going to, you're going to traverse things with praise that you wouldn't traverse without it. You're going to find the grace for your journey with praise that you wouldn't find without it. Praise is this incredible tool that God has put inside your spirit, not only for the magnification of who he is and his glory, but also to bring a grace and a strength and an openness to the hand and the provision of God in your own life as you move through your journey. 
Praise is important as a practice. Praise is important as an attitude. Now, uh, when you say the word praise, here's, here's, the, here's the way it's, it's understood in uh, its definition. To commend, to applaud, to express approval or admiration of, to extol in words or song, to magnify, to glorify, Amen. right? So, so praise has to do with my expression and the way I express Amen. something. And specifically, the way I express my approval of God. You know, when your kids do well, what do you do? You laud them with praise. Right? And, and when, maybe even if they fail, you can still laud them with praise. You can say, boy, you, I, know you, I know you didn't win here, but man, you did. your effort was amazing. Right? As an example. Because in doing that, what are you doing? You're building the house. You're building this environment where they find acceptance where they find empowerment, where they overcome their shortcomings because praise begins to do this in their own soul. So we shared this last week and it's important to embrace today is that thanksgiving is the attitude that we've got to have, this attitude of gratitude, but praise is the expression. So I start with an attitude of gratitude and then I find its expression through the mechanism of praise. So praise is critical. Now the psalmist said this in Psalm 34, he said, I will bless the Lord all the time. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let me ask you a question. If praise is all that occupies your language, then it doesn't have the opportunity to be occupied with complaint Amen. or with grumbling Amen. or with gossip. Amen. All right, so, so it becomes a shield to your soul becomes a barrier to the things that are detrimental in your own spirit, in your own heart. And then look at the second verse. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Now, there, there's something that I want to just, just say this in passing, that, that when I magnify the Lord, and I'm, I, it, it becomes an invitation it becomes an environment that encourages others' engagement. You don't believe me? Go to a Chiefs game. Yeah. Right? You go to a Chiefs game, and, and when everybody's sh cheering, you end up cheering with them. In fact, if you're not, everybody's going to look at you like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Mahomes and Kelsey just hooked up for a TD. And you're just sitting there? You, you're, you're not a Tampa Bay fan. You're wearing Chiefs colors, aren't you? That's right. That's right. Oh, it wasn't good enough for you that he threw it behind his back with his eyes closed? <laughs> that wasn't good enough for you? You get my point? So, 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 but, so, so, and, and if you're there and you're not doing or you're at the Jayhawks game or you're at whatever, if you're there and, and the praise becomes contagious. And there's something that resonates in the con context. And what does it do? It just, doesn't, it just doesn't celebrate what's happening. But have you noticed that the praising happens before anybody shot a basket and before anybody threw a pass? Because they're setting an environment for success. It encourages their soul to believe. It, it, it begins to it, remove the doubts and the anxieties and the fears. Man, I got people that believe in me. I got believe, people that, that trust that God, that, that I'm going to be able to accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish on this field. And, and this is what happens when your soul enters into praise. It begins to create an environment where others gather that same momentum. And then God is made great, magnified in the midst of you. And you begin to see him do the extraordinary thing. Because that's what God does, does on the path of praise. Does, does, it all works. Everything, everything in God's creation is created to express praise. Everything. Let me give you an example. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So the stars were created to do what? Declare the glory of God and proclaim, declares, praise his creation. 
Let's keep going. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Praise him sun, moon. Praise him all you shining stars. Praise him you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. Praise the Lord from the earth you great sea creatures and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and living birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above the earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. Those are God's words, not mine. Everything that was created was created for expressions of praise. So, to not operate and live in the context of praise would be to deny one of your created purposes. I got three amens. Well, I'm just not comfortable with praise. Well, you're not comfortable with God. That sounds a little judgmental. I'm not being judgmental, I'm just, just got to share the truth with y'all, right? So, so you, you and I were made to praise. I hope you came with your praise hats on. I hope you came with your praise shoes on. They would also be known as dancing shoes. I hope, I hope you're ready to praise the Lord. Look at Ephesians. You're going to get a lot of scripture today in case you weren't aware. We've already read almost two chapters. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what, what did I just share with you? That you and I were made to praise. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Look at somebody say, I'm blessed. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us and the beloved. Why has God done it? So that he would be praised. Why has he adopted you? So that he could be praised. Why has he chosen you in his foreknowledge? So that he could be praised. Why has he blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? So that he can be praised. Where? In you and through you. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having, be pre, being, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Oh, I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to let you know you were, you were created for praise. In him, let's keep going. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his Glory. I don't know if you noticed a theme here. The theme is you and I were created for praise. So here's why we should. And this is how he has created us. So that praise can become the easiest part of your journey with God. 
the easiest part of your journey with God, should emanate out of the natural capability. I never, I never notice a, a fish that struggles with swimming. I've never noticed a bird that struggles with flying unless it's injured. I've never noticed a deer that struggles with running. Right? Because he, he, I, I've never known a, 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 you know, a snake. Oh, let's not go there. You, you get the point. Right? You get the point. That, that, that it's in their natural aptitude to express what they express. We look at flying and we go, oh, that's amazing. We look at their running and we go, oh, that's amazing. We look at their swimming and we go, oh, that's amazing. But for them, it's what they do. It's what they were created for. And in the same way, in the same way, you were created for praise. So it should not be a wonder that you tap into that created grace in you and you find your expression. Now, I'm not saying everybody's going to express it the exact same way. But I am saying you're called to express it. And this is how. This is the baseline. This is the foundation. This is what he has put in us and done for us that creates the environment for our praise. Are you ready? You are blessed. You are chosen. You are adopted. You are accepted. You are redeemed. Anybody got a reason to praise him yet? Come on, I said you're blessed. You're chosen. You're adopted. You're redeemed. You're forgiven. You're informed. You're heirs of God. You have a destiny. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We have something to praise God for. Why? Because who we praise and why we praise has to match how we praise. Who are we praising? God. Who are we praising? Our Savior. And how are we, why are we praising? Because he's redeemed us. He's saved us. He's forgiven us. He's blessed us. He's given us an inheritance. He's given us a destiny. Come on, are you getting the point? He's given us an inheritance. And so if, if I understand that I've got this great God who's done all these great things for me, then my praise has to be epic. <sighs> so let me talk, let me, let me talk, if you're struggling, well, how do I do this? Well, let me give you seven types of praise, seven types of praise. Then, then I'll, 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 I'm almost done because I'm more interested in you praising the Lord. Look at this. Yada, these are, these are the Hebrew words that have been translated praise, bless, celebrate the goodness of God. So the first one uh, is yada. Everybody say yada. yada. This is the word or the, the language. Its essential meaning is surrendered praise. In other words, uh, what are, one of the admonitions of scriptures is lift your hands, all ye people. Extend your hands. Lift your hands. And, and why would you lift your hands? Well, in most contexts, when you lift your hands, it's because somebody's got a gun at your back and he's saying. And so when you lift your hands, it's a symbol of surrender. You're saying in praise, you're saying, Lord, I'm surrendering my will to yours. I'm surrendering my desires to yours. I'm surrendering how I'm perceiving this situation to you. I'm, I'm surrendering my attitude to that which conforms to your heart. Lord, I'm surrendering my purpose to that which is your purpose. Father, I, in, in, in expressions of praise, I'm letting go of the things that I'm holding dear to my carnal nature and to my rudimentary thoughts, and I'm saying, Saying, Lord, you are God, and I'm celebrating you above what I understand. I'm celebrating you above what I want. I'm celebrating you above what I'm experiencing. Why? Because I have put my faith in you. I've come to you. I'm weary. I'm heavy laden. I need some rest. And so he says, come on, give it to me. Cast your burden on me. One of the great ways you do this is by saying, I'm going to quit giving authority and priority and voice to my pain and voice to my victimization and voice uh, to my hardship and voice to my disappointment and voice to my resignation and I'm going to surrender. Lord God, you are good and your mercy endures to all generations. It's surrendered praise. Why are you cast down on my soul and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God for I shall again, what? Yada. I shall again surrender to you, and you will become my salvation. See, praise sets you up for salvation. Now, we think of salvation just in the eternal sense, but you might need to get out of something. 
or be delivered from something. And as believers, we find ourselves in spots. Like, Wait, man, how did I get here? When did this happen? Sometimes it's, it's just the, the context of life. Sometimes it's choices we made. It doesn't matter how it comes into our life. What matters is, is there's this point where we, you, my soul's cast down. I'm forlorn. I can't see my way out. I'm in turmoil. Everything's around me. But, I, but, but praise shifts my hope to God. And I'm going to praise him because I'm engaging that he is my solution. He's my answer. It's not at the bottom of a bottle. It's not in an injectable or an edible. It's in him. It's in him. Yada, surrendered praise. Why don't you try that? Just lift your, lift your hands and say, I'm just surrendering to your will, Lord. I'm just surrendering to your plan. I'm surrendering my desires to your desire. Lord, I'm just yielding in praise to you. Here's another one, Tahila. Tehillah, it's the second type, and it means spontaneous songs of praise. Now, my, my, for my wife, for my daughter, these are easy, right? And they do it on key and in pitch, which I can't promise all of us can do that, right? But it's this idea that I find a spontaneous expression. It's not rote. It's not manufactured. It's not even deliberative. It's just a response. It's just a reaction to the goodness of God. A spontaneous song. I remember years ago, my, my kids still laugh about this. We were, doing a, we were doing a thing. I think we were recording something for something. We used to sing. We used to have a singing group. The Freck Family Singers. And uh, kind of. It was kind of kind of a thing. It was really just a setup for charity because she was the singer of the bunch. But, but we, we, I remember we were singing something and I got inspired and I'm having this spontaneous like song of the Lord and oh no, we were in a church service actually. That's right. And I, I'm having this spontaneous song of the Lord in the midst of that and as I got done, I thought, man, that was great. <laughs> uh, and I actually sang this. I said, I hope we got that on tape. Three of you understand the weirdness of that. Anyhow, that was a spontaneous song that turned out at the end very badly. <laughs> Tehila is just this idea that I react to the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. That I don't have to, I, it's not always thought provoked. Right. And that's okay. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. This, this word, tahila, is this word, I will bless the Lord at all times. I'll, I'll find this spontaneity with God. It creates freshness in your relationship. Spontaneity. If God is always your 7 to 7.15 appointment, now I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I encourage you to do it. But, but man, why don't you shake it up sometimes? Why don't you come to second service? Uh, maybe let's shake it up. Let's, let's, let's do a harvest group. Come on. Come on. Come on. Right? But let, let's just find a way to kind of add some spontaneity. Maybe today I'm going to share my faith with somebody Come on. Come on. Yeah. that I wasn't expecting to. Yeah. These are just ways. So then we have the, the third type, which is barak, barak. And it means reverent praise. To kneel or to bow. Yeah, sometimes praise is an expression, an implied expression that I can, I can walk in humility. I can fall down being overwhelmed by the sense of God's goodness. And maybe I'm not shouting or screaming, but I'm thankful. I'm yeah. thankful. Yeah. I'm grateful. Oh, God, you're so good to me. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be a shout and a timbrel and a dance. Sometimes, sometimes it's this deep, heartfelt, quiet sincerity of reverence before God. What I'm trying to show you is that your expression of praise can take a lot of different paths. Can take a lot of different paths. And, and, and it implies to continually and consciously give place to God. Because that's what praise does. Praise displaces anything that is anti-God or against God in your life. 
If I don't walk in praise, then I'm allowing the things that are against God to be prioritized above God. Praise keeps me in tune with his spirit. And sometimes it's this overwhelming sense of deep gratitude that tears might flow. I might be on my knees. And I'm not sad, I'm just overwhelmed. And I want to express that overwhelming grace to the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Do you notice that blessing the Lord and magnifying his name is connecting, is connected to the fact that when I'm blessing the Lord, it means I'm reminding myself of all that he's done. Who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all my diseases, who crowns me with loving kindness and tender nurseries, who renews my youth like the eagles, who redeems my life from destruction. That these become the mechanisms. Praise keeps his greatness and his goodness ever before me. I don't forget. When I forget gratitude, then I forget what's been done. Have you ever wondered why we do holidays for specific things like Memorial Days and Labor Days and and Martin Luther King days and, and, and President's days and all these days that we do? Why do we do them? So we'll remember and be grateful for what people have had to do so that we can enjoy what we enjoy. It's important that we remember. And praise is a mechanism of that. Or it's done through memorial or through a special identified day, whatever the context is. That's why we do Easter. That's why we do Christmas. That's why we, one of the reasons why we do all of these things. Here's another one, halal. Halal, it's exuberant praise. This is where we get our word hallelujah. Hello. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout unto God with the voice of triumph. I'm going to be ecstatic in my expressions. Yeah, sometimes it's humble and tear-filled and quiet. And sometimes it's David dancing before the Lord with all of his might. And it's all good. It all works. It's always interesting to me how we tend to define church services by what types of worship expressions are allowable and not allowable, right? So, so you walk in, yeah, you know, there's people that actually dan- get out of their seat and dance in the aisle. I just think that's inappropriate. Where do you want them to dance? Because the options get pretty limited when we kick them out of church. Well, I'm just not comfortable with that. I'm not saying you have to do it. And as long as they're not kicking you while they're dancing, you should be good. Right? Or, you know, sometimes, sometimes they yell. Well, yeah, yeah, they do. Sometimes they're quiet. It's interesting. because So churches actually get defined by what expressions of praise are allowable and what expressions of praise are not. I'm going to suggest if it's in the Bible, it should be allowable. Now, in order, but allowable. Because some people use liberty as an excuse. Nah, that's not what we're talking about here. Hello, and now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Once again, just to this expression, tauda. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hang here for just a minute, tauda. It is what we would understand as the sacrifice of praise. Now, we talked a little bit about that yesterday. By him let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto our God, the fruit of our lips, Hebrews 13. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So the sacrifice of praise, in the context that I'm talking about it in this situation, is is, it is, it is agreeing with God despite what I feel. It's agreeing with what God has promised Despite what I'm experiencing. The sacrifice of praise is saying, I am aligning myself with God even though I'm not seeing it right now. Even though I'm not feeling it right now. Even though his promise may seem delayed right now. I'm going to, I'm going to agree with God that he is good. That he is faithful. That he is healer, that he is deliverer, that he is savior, 
that he is provider, even though I might not have all of that working in my life at this moment, I'm going to agree with what God's word says and who God is, despite what I'm experiencing, despite what I'm feeling, despite what's going on around me, I'm in agreement with God. That's Tauda. I am offering to God the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of my lips. I'm not going to give the enemy or myself any platform, any foundation, any good ground to absorb anything that is not in agreement with God. And we read this in Psalm 50. It says, the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. So he's seeing that there's, there's this idea that the sacrifice of praise is ordering your life correctly. Amen. It's putting your life in proper order. You're putting God first. Amen. Your experiences, your expectations, next. And something powerful happens because you're, you, you want a platform, you want a path where you see God do supernatural, miraculous things. This is it. I mean, I mean, this is it. The people that are praiseful are always living in the supernatural. Can I suggest that the supernatural, miraculous interventions of God are never known if we never have adversity or difficulty? How am I going to know that God is good in the land of the living unless I'm on the threshold of death? How am I going to know that God's able... Unless he's pulled me out of a few things. Because we can, let's, let's be honest, folks. We like comfort. We like comfort. We like safety. I get it. I get it. It's a natural inclination. But if I'm going to offer the sacrifice of praise, I'm going to say, Lord, I'm going to agree with you. And this is where my faith informs my praise. Instead of letting my circumstance inform my praise. Or my feelings inform my praise. Aren't you glad you got up an hour earlier for this? So, here's another one. Zamar, Zamar, another type. Zamar, and it's just musical. Now, now you might say, I'm not a musician. My wife can play anything. She can, she, the Lord gave her the gift of, of instruments and, and playing instruments, and she's amazing. And I, I, I look at Pastor Lester, who plays a guitar upside down and backwards. Makes no sense to me. Uh, but it's clearly the grace of God on his life, and, and, and he finds his expression musically, and it's easier for them to platform, we think, right? So I'm excluded because I'm not, I'm, I, don't, I don't play an instrument. I'm not musical. Wrong. Let me show you your 10 string instruments. And I've heard some of y'all clap, and it's... I get it. But clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Come on, you can, even if it's a little off rhythm, out of beat, and some of you are doing it right now, God bless you. Keep it going, keep it going, because there's a 10-string instrument that's work. God is going to use you. You're saying something with the clapping of your hands. I can't play an instrument. I can't sing a song very well, but I can clap my hands, all ye people. I can shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Come on, it's a good thing. So you got instruments, tap your feet, tap your toe, move a little. Don't move like that, we might have the ushers take you out. But the point is, it is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name. Once again, this is the word zamar that's in here. And he's talking about, he's talking about the musical play. Here's... Here's the la last one, and then, I, I'm, then I'm going to preach my message. <laughs> Shabbat. Shabbat. This is the shout of praise. Not just exuberance, not just emotional expression, but this is the, the, this is the informed and declared shout. So the perfect example of this is the children of Israel walking around Jericho. They had to walk in seven days, six days of silence, right? And on the seventh day, walk in silence. Until the final horn blew and then all of Israel was to shout. That, and, and this is an expression of praise. It wasn't a war shout. Because they had spent seven days in worship. Seven days walking around something that was impossible to conquer. 
seven days walking around and listening to the jeers and the jests of those on the walls. Seven days of doing nothing but walking in a circle. Seven days. And the command was, so sometimes it's this command in me that I need, I, I'm going to shout. And this shout's going to bring down the wall. And this shout's going to make possible what's been impossible. And it's out of obedience, and it's out of faith, and it's out of confidence that God is delivering the victory. Not my strength, not my might, not my power, but God's delivering the victory. Shabbat. Shout unto God. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord, with the sound of the trumpet, God goes up on our shout. So let me, let me illustrate the journey to praise, okay? If you go to Genesis chapter 29... If you go to Genesis 29, you'll hear the story of Rachel and Leah, and specifically the story of Leah. Now, if you don't know who Leah is, Leah was the first wife of Jacob. He was the first, she was the first wife not by choice, but by deception. Laban, who was her father, uh, while Jacob had worked for basically seven years to get the hand of Rachel, when it came time for the wedding feast, Jacob got a little tipsy. Rachel shows up, consummates the wedding, wakes up the next day, says, who are you? Too late, you're married now. Did I say Rachel? Yeah, it was Leah. Leah's, Leah's the one that snuck in. Now, not, not that she had designs to do that, but that Laban wanted to set this up. So then Jacob had to serve seven more years so that he could uh, get the hand of Rachel. And, you know, so now he's got two wives and, and, and one that he... Uh, loves and adores, and one he got stuck with. Uh, that's just the truth of the situation. And so, and so there's a problem with Rachel. Uh, she can't have kids. This is the track that Jacob wants to run down. But it's not going to be satisfied through his preferred loved relationship. Instead, Leah, feeling like the rejected and hated one that she is, the only thing she can offer to her husband is availability so that sons can be produced. And guess what? She's, she's Babe Ruth. She, she's producing sons left and right. This creates, so, so when she has her first son, his name is Reuben. And Reuben's name means behold a son. And if you read the story, it's interesting because she says, now that I produced for my husband an heir, a heritage, a family, a legacy, now my husband will love me. Eh. Doesn't work. So then she makes herself available and they produce another son. His name's Simeon. Simeon's name means heard with acceptance. In other words, she, she actually says this. She says, since the Lord has heard that I've been hated, he has blessed me with a son. So she called him Simeon, heard with acceptance. In other words, my husband rejects me, but God accepts me. And she's hoping that with two sons, her husband's heart will turn. And doesn't happen. She has her third son. His name's Levi. So she's tried to produce a, son, a firstborn. It doesn't create intimacy. It doesn't create connection. It doesn't create the emotional bond, the love bond that she's wanting out of a marriage. She gets a second son, once again, creating and expanding his legacy. It still doesn't do it. He has a third, she has a third son. The son's name is Levi. And she actually uses this language. Now, with three sons, the idea of completion, a three-stranded cord's not equally broken. Now that I've given him a third son, my husband will be attached to me. And... Doesn't work. So she has created intimacy, she's created an environment, 
Every way she's related to God and relating to her circumstance is based on her need to be loved, to be accepted, to be valued, to be appreciated, and none of it is working. All of her efforts, which would normally create it in any context, isn't creating it with Jacob. And you thought Jacob was a star, man. Right now, he's not a star. But then she has her fourth son. Now remember, Leah hasn't had one yet. She has her fourth son, and she names him Judah. She's gone from, man, I'm producing children, I'm hated, and God's still take, giving me something that's going to create, uh, maybe my husband's going to be a connected and attached to me, to now I am, what does she say? She just says, I'm just going to praise I'm not going to try to earn something. I'm not going to try to deserve something. I'm not going to try to make him have any admonition to me. You know what I've decided? This is, my, this is where I'm at, and I've decided I'm going to put God first. I'm going to praise him no matter what my marriage relationship looks like. I'm going to praise him no matter how rejected I am. I'm going to praise him no matter what's going on in my life. I'm going to lift up a praise, and what I'm going to produce out of my life is going to be a, a testimony to God's worthiness, God's blessing. God's favor, and I am going to produce praise. And guess what? Once she got to praise, it becomes the lineage by which the Christ could be revealed in the earth. He didn't do it through Rachel. He didn't through the, do it through the schemes of men. He did it through a woman who had to traverse rejection and hatred and disappointment and instead found a place called praise. And when you find a place called praise, breakthrough happens in your life. Breakthrough happens in your life. Would you do something with me? Stand to your feet all over the room. I want to encourage you to send Judah first. I want to encourage you to put praise in front of it all. Boy, where would she have been had she gotten to praise at the get-go? Oh, sometimes we just don't get there. Our experience has to bring us there. But I want you to do something right now. I want you to I want you to do yada, and I just want you to lift up your hands, and I want you to just begin to praise God. Just find something that is not manufactured, something that isn't crafted by a singer or a worship team member. I want you to find something that's authentic in your own spirit, and just begin to be thankful. Begin to express your praise. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know what kind of disappointments you've experienced along the way. But if you can find Judah first, it's going to make the path easier. So would you do that right now? Just, just open your mouth, open your heart, open your voice. And just, pre just declare your thankfulness and your gratitude to your king. Father, we thank you that today you're breaking down walls and you're destroying barriers. You're bringing us into wholeness and health. And I thank you for the grace that you pour out so abundantly. Even now as we pray. In Jesus' name. Now listen, you can, you can worship and praise him with your giving. You can worship and praise him with communion. You can worship and praise while you're sitting there. You can come to the altars. You can have someone pray with you. It doesn't matter how you do it, but I want you to exchange with God in a meaningful way today. And let praise be your platform. Let praise be your path.